Salvete Domini, Domineique, Maxime Honorabilis, est mi honori, vobis hanc acroas in tradere. Well, I'll, pop, I'll prefer to uh, continue in English, but that is just a reminder that Latin is not totally dead, at least when it comes to the speakers. But it's true in a sense that Latin will not change its structure in the future. So this language has solved the archival problem. How do you make sure that people can read what you write today in a thousand years from now? Because it has been standardized. So uh, we have the good fortune that people a thousand years in the past already had this insight, so they chose to write in Latin, and we can read it today. Isn't that marvelous? So I'm looking especially at this Latin heritage. There are some peculiarities about it because now we want to read it not only with our eyes, but with machines, this distant reading mode, and we want to also find similarities and structures in large amounts of texts. So, the structure of this, uh, this small uh, uh, contribution is first, why Latin? I already gave uh, some answer. We look at problems uh, connected to this endeavor some prospects and some recent progress that has been made. So we have a huge heritage of Latin writings and printings. It's probably the largest body of historical literatures in any single language because it had been used in Europe for so many centuries. And maybe you don't know it, but Latin production of printings dominate until the middle of the 18th century the printing production of any language that varies, of course, from country to country, but uh, this one is uh, at least true for Germany. And many titles that have initially been printed in the early modern era have never been reprinted. So if we want to get access to these texts, we will have to convert them from these original printings, as bad as they now uh, are, and so Latin can either a barrier to this treasure, to this heritage, or it can be a key. That depends on whether we are able to turn the key, whether the door remains locked or we can open it. For some reason, I'm, uh, I don't know, it has been left out of the impact project. I can uh, easily understand that there are not many uh, subject matter experts who are interested in both Latin and in OCR and other technology. But maybe we can change this in the future. So here is a, an example page. This is a, a 16th century printing, and, and you see all kinds of uh, historical font issues. For instance, you have this ubiquitous long S, as in Nescio. Uh, you have uh, historical lit uh, ligatures, like this AE, and the CT, and the SC. Also, polytonic Greek uh, words show up without previous warning. So these were very educated people. They used Greek and uh, other languages all the time. There are certain kinds of diacritics. I'll talk a little more about that. And abbreviations. You see the tilde above this, the E. So that, this means there is an N missing. It can mean other things as well. This is one of the problems, that the abbreviations are ambiguous. So if you want to resolve it, you have to look at the context. And then there are historical spellings. You wouldn't uh, perhaps expect that for a standardized language, as I said, but even standardization leaves some room for variation. And it turns out that for some reason, uh, these early printings and the writings, whenever there is a double I at the end, the printers prefer to write it as an IJ. Maybe it looks prettier, I don't know. It's nothing, no other uh, uh, thing uh, about it, but uh, if you want to correct the OCR text and compare to a modern lexicon, you won't find uh, Ali Yi. You only find an Ali Yi. So you have to uh, make sure you get this right. So, what are the problems? We have all the issues of historical typography and spelling. Because this is not special to Latin. This is true for many early modern uh, languages and printings as well. And we have the ambiguities and the abbreviations. 
especially in what is called the incunabula. These are the early printings up to the 1500, the end of December 1500, this is an artificial date, but the early printings from the invention in 1450 up to that time try to emulate the manuscript tradition very closely, as is often the case if you invent a new technology. The first that comes to mind is just to reproduce what has been there before. So it's full of all kinds of strange variations. Then we have these diacritics, and actually they have some use because they were used in the early texts to disambiguate some of uh, the meanings or the uh, parts of speech, for instance, between uh, the use of a uh, word form as adverb or vocative. Alte is an adverb. Alte could be a vocative with a short e, or adverb and pronoun, like quam with its uh, accent is an adverb, again, and pr pronoun would be quam without that, or a conjunction preposition, cum with and without this uh, diacritic, or the ablative and the nominative. It helps to understand the sentence on first sight. Now, this has long come uh, out of uh, use, so if you think you have to decode Latin anyway, it won't, uh, you, you can just about uh, forget about it. But at that time, people were very well trained in that language, and uh, this helped to disambiguate at first sight what it meant. So maybe you should actually record it, because later you can always throw it away, but having more information is better than having less information. And if you do a post tagging or if you do other kinds of annotation, you could use it. So enough of uh, theory, let's have a look. These are three pages, example pages I took from printings from three centuries, 1544, 1649, and 1779. This is the beginning of Tacitus's history called Annales, so a yearly recording of things that happened in Rome from the death of Augustus. And let's see how off-the-shelf OCR software could cope with it. No training, nothing just out of the box, and you see the first column, or the second column actually, Abbey Fine Reader, which I take as the industry standard and a kind of model we have to compare against. It's easily, for all three printings, uh, the best recognition results. They are not great, that's not in the 90s, they are in the 80s, but it's better than Tesseract or Octopus out of the box. Unfortunately, that's the end of the story for us end users, except if the company would invest in uh, train Abbey, making available the training files. So Tesseract is, is lower, Octopus is lower as well. So uh, this is our starting point. And the goal now is, how much better can we get? There are some things that uh, suggest themselves to overcome the obstacles. The first is training. You could do two things. One, you take an existing text, lots of texts are available, or take them from the web or elsewhere, and generate artificial, historical-looking images with some degradation and auto, on an automatic way in the sense that you take historical-looking fonts, true-type fonts you have on your computer, do some degradation model over it, and then generate some artificial images, and it works reasonably well for all kinds of modern printings, 19th century and beyond, but not so well actually for uh, historical printings, you'll see later. The other one would be, take some real images, transcribe them very meticulously with all the features you want to be recognized later. The problem is, this is a manual labeling work, it's a very uh, yeah, cumbersome work to do except uh, you may have done it already within the IMPACT project, so with my pledge is to anybody who has these ground truth texts, please make them available. This could help a lot in this era. Then, of course, you could apply lexical resources, both in the recognition uh, phase, then it's called intelligent character recognition, as you know, but uh, also later in the post-correction, and you can do post-processing. 
And also, uh, you want to first correct the OCR errors, but not the historical spellings, which we have seen that introduces another channel of variation. And uh, Christoph told us yesterday in his uh, talk about the possibilities to unmask this channel so that we can actually focus just on the OCR errors. And also, we can add some kind of annotation. So we want to expand the ligatures. We want to expand all the abbreviations, which can only be done from the context. You need a good language model for enable, uh, to be able to do that. And then you have the text you could actually uh, investigate and uh, with the help of computers. So, just a brief look at two of the tools you could and uh, should actually provide uh, and build in the first instance at the CIS in Munich. There is this Lextractor tool, which is able to record some historical variations. So this is a very early uh, proof of concept that it works for Latin as well. You see the different colors. Uh, the colors mean this is an unknown word until now. So what is unknown? First, there are all the proper names. This is a writing of Erasmus of Rotterdam, one of the heroes of humanist, humanist uh, literature and a very well-known Latin Latinist of his time. And then there, there are also some uh, red words like Juventuti or Johanni. These words are known, but not with a J, because the J uh, actually was mostly written as an I. So this is a, a, just an instance of this historical spelling. You find more instances at the right hand side where there are all words which could be uh, made into a modern dictionary word by replacing the J to an I. So, uh, with these historical spelling patterns, you could get rid of some variation of OCR and uh, the modern lexicon just by applying, by applying these patterns and then concentrate on the proper OCR errors later. The other one is the post correction tool. I won't sorry, uh, tell you very much about it because it has been presented already yesterday, but you see it's working for Latin as well. Here you have an error series. If you haven't trained your OCR engine properly, it will mostly recognize the long S as an F because that's the nearest character in shape to the, to the long S. And you could just do a batch correction as was yesterday demonstrated. So now let's take a look at some more pages, how this training would work. So this is an example of a 1589 book. You see all these kinds of floral design. This is a problem in itself because now you also have to do some proper document analysis to be able to distinguish between design elements and text lines. And different engines have different capabilities uh, to cope with it. We also heard in an earlier uh, talk that Abbey is very good. Uh, Tesseract does just bounding boxes so that these are rectangles, not so good. And Ocrobus uh, does almost none of these at all, so it assumes there is pure text. So you can, in the coming pages, when I show you some numbers, you can expect the second of these five pages to show not, a, not so good a recognition rate as the others. Also, if you train, you see in the second page, there are some strange uh, capital letters, and if you train from real images, these are rare instances. So uh, the training would not be very well done on, on these um, rare uh, shapes of characters. Otherwise, you would have to provide uh, many of these instances and do a, have a lot of have a big, very big training corpus. So let's have a look at the at the five uh, pages. The first column shows the Abbey results. The second one, Tesseract and the third octopus. This is all untrained. But what's remarkable, on page 17, you already, uh, you already see this uh, red result, 86% of character accuracy. That's already better than Abbey. So there's some hope you can perhaps go beyond Abbey. Now you could do a font training. And this font training was done on the artificial method, method A, I mentioned earlier. So you see, okay, Tesseract is, is really improving up to 10 percentage point, for instance, for the first page. So it does help. 
And then you can go one step further and say, if I had a very good lexicon of word forms, how much would it improve? Now I don't have a very uh, all-encompassing lexicon of word forms, but I just took the ideal lexicon, that is I tokenized the ground truth of all five pages and said this is a lexicon. This ideal lexicon because it makes sure every instance of a word form is there to be recognized. It will never be reached in practice, but just gives you an upper limit what could be reached. That is the column with the heading Tesseract in brackets font. It had font training plus the next one, font training plus lexicon. Now you get already in the 90s, but it's a little bit of cheating on the lexicon side. And yesterday I talked to yesterday Dose and he said, well, he saw my paper and uh, skimmed over it and got the impression Tesseract wins. Well, Octopus has some segmentation um, issues. It's not so good in that uh, respect, but I wouldn't want you to go away from my talk and get the impression well, Tesseract is the contender. We should concentrate all efforts on it. So last night, I took the opportunity and trained a little bit on the Octopus side and do the line segmentation with Tesseract and then just present Octopus uh, the proper lines. And I did some, with, with available ground truth, some training on real images. That's the last column. And you see Octopus. Now, you actually have to compare the last column and the last but one. So forget about the lexicon side is dominating Tesseract in every instance, in every page. And also, apart from the second page, this is the thing with the uh, very elaborate uh, capital letters, which show up only rarely in these five pages, it's almost uh, better than Abbey. So Octopus is a very uh, new technology in this latest incarnation. This is a version 0.7. So have a look at it, at it if you... Um, if you are pursuing these very old historical documents. And by the way, Octopus doesn't know anything about language. It doesn't know anything about characters. It just does a neural network training and is able to classify an over-segmented line, which it segments into 500 slices into character classes, which you give them. And uh, this, these are some of the results which come out of it. I want to uh, demonstrate this in another instance as well. This is an early printing of 1500 of the Satirica of Petone. And you see, actually, I don't know who did this. Yeah? Somebody did a sacrilege and scribbled into these uh, ancient book pages. And even between the lines, though this is probably hard to recognize. Also, it's a very unusual font. It looks like Fraktur, but this is some very special font. So what I did, I uh, cut off the margins as well as I could. Sometimes some, there is some, on the, the shorter lines, there is some handwriting as well. And I let Tesseract or Ocrupus uh, cut the lines as well. I only threw out the lines which only contained handwriting. And uh, let's see what the result was. So Ocrupus or Tesseract done with some rec fracture recognition gives a very mediocre result. If, on the other hand, I had 16 pages, I trained on the first 12, that was a training set, the last four were the test set, I did some training on this, these first 12 pages and applied them to the last four, even for this bad example with handwriting uh, contamination, I get very good results. I think uh, they speak for themselves. So, what's the summary? If you go for very old printings, of course, that's what we all know and expect. They are very hard to OCR out of the box. At least if you want to have meaningful words and not just mainly garbage. The good news is both Tetheract and Ocrupus can be trained to results above Abbey at the present state. So, I expect Abbey to catch up perhaps as well. But uh, this is a company decision, and we as researchers uh, cannot wait for that. And we have to train for our niche applications. And this is not a big commercial market, but it's a cultural, very rich market. And of course, applying lexica as well as font training helps a lot. And Ocrupus seems to have a superb recognition engine if it's trained properly. 
but it has to be somehow uh, augmented by better line recognition that come currently come from other from other engines. You could do the the segmentation of lines either with Abby or with Tesseract or with some help of your tools from uh, the Salford University and uh, get some better uh, text and image and other stuff uh, segmentation. And then of course post-correction will do the rest and will have to do the rest, but it's much better if you start from a result well above 90% than if you start from a result below 80%. So that's the end and thank you for your interest. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, most interesting presentation. I have basically two questions. Uh, is about the encoding sort of. Uh, so, would you see uh, the uh, well to expand abbreviations, for instance, as a core task of OCR, or should that be a post-processing step, as in having a, a, well another layer of information? So, I, I don't think it's a proper OCR task on the one hand, but on the other hand, I don't think OCR is uh, everything and all to everybody because in the end, we have our uh, customers, so to speak, yeah. so the real humanists who are interested in the texts. And it would help them if you gave them perfectly uh, recognized text, but it would help them a lot more if you also expanded the text because what's usually done, if they transcribe an old manuscript, they resolve all these ambiguities by hand already in this conscription phase. But you lose some information which might be valuable in itself, if only for scholars who look at font development over centuries or any or, or other stuff. And also they make errors, and you couldn't you couldn't easily uh, catch the errors if they do some wrong uh, expansion. So I would say there is a complete process of single steps. OCR is one of them, and post correction is another one. And this is a kind so of more general as, annotation. Uh, you would see that as some added value. Exactly. So, because, yeah, I also think that would be very useful, uh, you know, uh, to researchers who might be interested in the development of yeah, fonts, of uh, characters, spelling, variations, and so on. Yes, and the other question is um, uh, related to your evaluation. Um, so, basically, do you do some uh, sort of normalization first, or how do you go about um, such abbreviation characters, with the, uh, what was it, the M with tilde and so on? So, uh, do you have that as a character in your ground proof? Yes. And do you expect the OCR engine to also return exactly. some Unicode code point for that? Uh, I, I guess use, it doesn't exist yes. one for... I use Unicode code points, points as much as possible and I stay away from the private use area because that's going to change and it's uh, font specific. But fortunately enough from the MUFI initiative, the middle uh, medieval, I don't Unicode know... Unicode font initiative. Code initiative. Yes, but there are, by the way, also private... Uh, use area <laughs> code points. So it's just that they are a recommendation, uh, but it's uh, not a part of the standard. So, but uh, basically, that's that explains, I guess, why uh, Abby performs uh, not as well as the others because Abby obviously doesn't even know those characters which you did train in the other engines. Well, this is only true for the last example, but there I didn't record every Abby's things. But for the other one, there, there are no so many things uh, which Abby couldn't recognize. It, it couldn't recognize the long S, but then it changed the ground truth to have also the, the short S as a, as a... You did uh, some normalization to basically uh, yes. map everything. Okay, to have yeah. a fair comparison. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. If I, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, dictionary could you be able to, to, to make for Latin? If you, let's say, Abbey would be better if you had, you, you can use Abbey with a user supplied dictionary. So you could improve your results by that. And uh, what kind of dictionary where could you be able to make to, for Latin? Well, you take a big commercial dictionary which is out of out of uh, uh, which is in the public domain and then you generate all possible word forms the other way would be take a huge corpus and tokenize it so you catch also the rare word forms and some work in this direction has been done actually um, 
by the Greg Crane, of course, who has uh, tokenized the classical literature. Unfortunately, that's not nearly enough if you go for the early modern era. And uh, we are working on an improved version. But Abby, Abby actually, as you said, has the ability to uh, have a lexicon provided from the outside, but it doesn't seem to help as much as you would expect. So the font issues are much more severe. Uh, it, it, uh, there are too many ambiguities. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your, for your speech. I was very glad to hear. Um, and I'm quite impressed with your, with your results. Um, I would like to come back about uh, abbreviations and specific signs printed in documents. Um, if I understood well, you want to produce um, a transcription with expanded abbreviations and with no ligatures and no, no specific signs. Um, why, <laughs> in fact? Is, is, is it only because you, we are not able um, to produce transcription with typographic uh, historical signs because of the lacks of Unicode, in fact? Or is it because you want you, you think about the, the dissemination of the text and you, you want that many people can read them? Um. It depends what you mean by transcription. I need a, what is called a di diplomatic transcription, which has all the peculiarities in the ground truth. That's the transcription. But in the end, and that is an annotation layer, I wouldn't throw any of the inf record information away. In the end, I would like to have something which enables, for instance, information retrieval. But and in, in fact, it's parallel transcriptions. You have, um, um, I think the author should produce um, uh, what you call a diplomatic transcription with um, um, one digital character corresponding with one type, one printing, printing type. Um, and I think you, you cannot ask uh, the, the, the software to, to expand abbreviation and to, 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 to process uh, some, some, some post corrections and so on, um, um, because you will lose all the, the graphical information that um, people who, want, who only want to read the text, they, they don't need them, but um, many historians of the books, historians of the typography, paleographers, they need this information, and one of the main problems in paleography or paleotypography is that we do not have uh, digital transcriptions reflecting the, the, the original states of the, of the sources. And just one information, uh, um, I think you, you spoke about Mufi um, uh, just a few minutes ago. We, we are currently uh, building up in, in Tours in France, um, in the Center for Renaissance Studies, um, uh, a project that is the, uh, an inventory of the printing types used during the Renaissance for Latin and French texts in order to, to provide um, a kind of murphy like uh, encoding, um, uh, precisely because we, we would like to, to produce um, with OCR tools, some transcriptions um, uh, that reflect the, the state of the original source. But um, I think we have to think about diplomatic transcriptions and normalized transcription as different things uh, that should exist par parallelly. Um, and I agree with you. Uh, so if you have ground truth, which is diplomatic, I would, very, would be very interested in it, because I would, could use this to train the engine. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, can you go back to the slide which you had on the training of the Tesseract engine? Because if I, um, if I took that correctly, you, you said, uh, or there was another one, but um, you trained on a synthetic, uh, a synthetic training set, so basically creating exist, using existing uh, fonts and existing texts or transcriptions. Um, we, we actually we have a project also with, uh, with some colleagues also from Salford and in the US um, where we also tried to train Tesseract and we found that um, 
So we also did that synthetic approach. And I was impressed that you actually boosted the, the accuracy by 10% by with that, because we found actually we, it, it didn't work very well for us. Um, um, so what we tried also then, and I think that was also in your, uh, in your slides, to train on uh, real documents and transcribe them. Um, again, we didn't get like the best possible training result. Eventually, we got the best uh, training uh, uh, success with Tesseract on creating uh, synthetic documents made up from uh, clippings of characters from real documents. But those um, had to be pristine. So in terms of like the baseline needed to be very precise, the spacing between the characters needed to be precise. Because as far as I understand, Tesseract in the training has its own internal noise model that it applies then to this sort of pristine document and then learns on that. So actually that's what, um, what we eventually got uh, the best success uh, in training Tesseract with. And it might be interesting for you also to try it out. There is a tool actually produced in a project that will help you create such uh, artificial pristine uh, ground truth. And actually um, we also found that not much is uh, needed of that. So um, after sort of like five, five pages of uh, text, or say with, with like 1,500 to 2,000 tokens, it's the training sort of converges. So uh, you get probably other than uh, with Ocropos, which uses neural networks, you don't get much increments anymore with adding more uh, training data. With Tesseract. With Tesseract, yeah. Yeah, the Tesseract training on real images I didn't do because it seems to be very labor intensive because you have to correct all the boxes he makes about the characters. Uh, this box tiff step is, is very uh, cumbersome and uh, we owe this uh, very nice Occupus, uh, it's a free software, it's open source, to Tom Broyle, who now works with Google, as does Ray Smith, who is the author of Tesseract. So we can expect that these two engines will merge to a certain extent, and each engine, or at least one engine, having the best parts of available from both of them. 